Hello. Today I want to explore an important lesson regarding the separation of sound design and writing by exploring the quite insane synth engine hiding inside the tiny Roland MC101. So when I was about 15, my older brother, who was a DJ, bought himself some music gear. I was curious about electronic music and was discovering things like Orbital and Aphex Twin and was particularly drawn to a small silver box with buttons and dials, branded Roland, model number 303. It was, of course, not the TP-303, but an MC303, and it was the first piece of music technology that I ever messed with. And playing with pre-made patterns on the MC303, editing sounds, muting things in and out, was me discovering that it was probably within my capability to make electronic music. And when my great uncle passed away, he left me enough money for me to buy a stereo and some music gear, and I never looked back. So the Roland MC range is in part why I am here at all. And I think they have an amazing role to play in helping people discover electronic music. And of course, they are powerful writing tools for seasoned musicians too. So I've been having a mess around with the MC 101, which is kind of like a modern MC 303 of a sort. And the question is, what can we learn from it? Well, it's taught me two interesting lessons. One, don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> just because something looks simple doesn't mean it's just for beginners. And in fact, the more I dug into the MC101, the more I found it was eye-wateringly capable and you can make thoroughly legit tracks on it. It's obviously just four tracks, but I really like that. You can't just add and add and add tracks. You have to write properly, which is to say making full use of the four available slots and swapping track functions in and out on a per clip basis if you need to, which you could do. And you can have what are called drum kits, which are samples. Each one of these 16 slots has a sample. These were all samples of mine. And you could have four sets of these going at once, four 64 samples playing at once. And because there's an SD card slot on the pack, you have a library of gigabytes of samples or one shots or whatever you've got on your SD card. Total sample time, by the way, is 12 minutes at once in mono. Things have moved on since the S760. You also have looper tracks, which are a way of re-recording sound internally, which actually do let you kind of surpass the four track limit because you can bounce things down to those looper tracks, consolidating tracks. And there is 60 seconds of time available for that. But most interestingly for a Roland synth nerd is tones, which is what we're going to investigate in more detail today. What is a tone? Well, a tone is a synth sound. But what you maybe don't realize from looking at the MC101 is there is an absolutely insane synth engine lurking behind the panel. You just don't obviously get full editable control of it from the device itself. You can come into settings and adjust levels, panning, and some basic stuff, attack, decay, release. So there is a little bit of control that you can have. And there is also uh, some dedicated parameters, sys controls, which the sound designer can make available for you. Sound designer, you say. 
Yes, if you want to make your own sounds from scratch, the way that you do it is with a plugin called Xenology Pro, and you port them over to the MC101 via the little SD card. Now, Xenology Pro, you don't get with it. You do have to either buy it or subscribe to Roland's cloud thingamabob in order to get access to it. But if you have it, it's not just an editor. Xenology Pro is a plugin, so it makes the sounds that you will hear the MC101 make. As a quick example, I've got a bunch of scenes and sort of patterns that I've made with sounds that I've made here. I just want you to hear like this. Roland Bliss, indeed. Anyway, I want to show you how these sounds are actually constructed, so let's go to the computer and see quite what the sound engine in this is capable of. Here we are, inside my computer. Quiet, isn't it? Not for long. Here we are with Xenology Pro. So this is a plugin that Roland sell, and they've got lots of plugins. This is their whole cloud thing, and I have been given a license for all of the cloud, so I've been basically living my sort of teenage fantasies of having like the biggest Roland synth collection ever in my DAW. It's actually genuinely brilliant, especially having things like the 70777 mixed with like SRX dance tracks and like an SH2 a JX3P, a Jupiter 8, and a JV1080. It's like, it's like everything. It's like the 90s, the 80s, and the 70s all smashed together in one big, wonderful rave in my DAW. Anyway, and so to like walk you through, it starts like this. A piano. I'm in Rompler territory, which is sort of true. And there is an absolutely eye-watering amount of sounds, you know. <laughs> Hello. The sound of a monsoon. The sound of a P5 square, Jupiter 8 square. Like actual sampled waveforms from those machines. You know, so you can actually get kind of semi-realistic things. Shakuhachi. At last. And of course, the pan flute. Wicked. I mean, those things are actually genuinely wicked to have as part of a synth patch. And the whole like patching thing is built up of what are called partials. They all add up these partials to make a whole. So you've actually got four, effectively four synth sounds per sound. And actually, this blew my mind a tiny little bit, which is that the if you're playing with the PCM sounds here, you can have this in mono pan flute again but if you hit stereo you can have a different sound on the right hand side let's go with an accordion bet you thought i'd never give you the pan flute accordion sound and of course we can add release add vibrato And we're instantly getting into 90s Warp Records territory. Well, that's where I like to live. But we can adjust the cutoff for the sound. Sorry, the partial, I should say. Like, there's a individual partial filter. So I could go like LPF, which is nice. The basic one, because it is resonance compensated. Oh. And then you've got effects as well. And I mean... I just want to touch on those briefly, but it's not just like one or two effects. It's like a whole, like, room full of effects, which can all be part of the sound, all very well modelled and, like, very well designed. And um, tape echo. So that's a partial. 
that whole sound is only a quarter of what a sound can contain. So if I turn on another partial, you've got all these other modes. So that was the PCM one. And in there are hundreds and hundreds of sounds that you can mix and you can have them in stereo. But then there's like virtual analog sounds. So you can then mix in virtual analog sounds with your PCM sounds. Or have more PCM sounds if you wanted. Juno. That sounds nice. We can apply the LFO2 to control the PWM of that. Nice. I'm going to adjust the LFO2. It's here. Like this sort of ghost. You can see the ghost of the original setting. Delay time. You can control the onset. You can have it fade in. I mean, this is the thing when you start to get into the sound like capabilities, there's all these little like sneaky things like, oh goodness, you can edit that. And there's actually this somewhat overwhelming thing. I don't want you to freak out, but pro edit where it really, really takes the gloves off. And it's like, here are all of the things that this sound engine is capable of letting you edit. And it's like... I feel like I'm at the foot of Mount Olympus staring up, which is not probably a good thing to just like say during a demo. It's like, obviously, like it's good that this thing would be straightforward to use, but it is. It's just that that pro edit stuff is there if you want to dig into it. The majority is in this visual edit. And there's actually some really nice kind of um, concessions where you can double tap OSCs and I can then see the all four oscillators of each partial in one page. You know, and you can do the same thing with all these. So if you're editing a certain thing like an LFO, they're all on one page. So it becomes quite straightforward or you can sort of split them apart. And now I'm seeing the complete contents of one partial, or at least most of the content. Analog feel, which adds a little bit of quiver I like that. A little bit of like vibe. And then of course we can change the pitch of that. And we do it down here. Come on, that's really nice. Oh, I love this stuff. I absolutely love it. Okay. There's kind of a reason why all of this is in a plugin and it's not on the physical device necessarily because it's what a plugin is good at. And so you can do your sound design on a plugin and you shove it into a little box. Should we save that? Let's call it. Um, that's really nice. That's really nice. You know, you use a keyboard and just like, that's really nice. So you've got VA. And by the way, there are loads of other things that you can do to the VA waveforms, not just like picking them. Um, like this. There are loads of clever little things, like if you click here and adjust pulse width, you can pulse width like a saw wave and turn it into something else. And if you adjust fat, you can basically kind of wave fold it, but it's not wave folding, it's more like... Kind of like morph. I don't know what you call it. It's like a wave squish. But you can basically deform the waveforms and turn them what are otherwise sort of, you know, your standard waveforms into something completely different. And Super Saw, when we were Roland, we didn't have Super Saw. 
good for trance, mate. Why not? Then we also have PCM Sync. These sort of waveforms, which are kind of like animated. And there's just lots of interesting things that you can do when you modulate between the waveforms, because you could do that too, good grief. Sync, ring mod, cross mod, two different types. I mean, really bonkers. So that's just two partials. I'm partial to more partials. Sorry, I'm really so sorry, I'm so sorry. So I want to make the parts that will basically form the core of a kind of electro tune. I think in order for this video to not be like four and a half hours long, what I'm going to do is pause and spend a few hours making some sounds and then I'll show you what I did. Hi, it's hmm, about three and a half to four hours later. And I basically made 22 different sounds. So we've got um, a whole sort of smorgasbord of different things. Bliss in it. Nice. <laughs> That's really nice. D-tune bass. Bell squidge. Which combines a bell with a squidge. Tough bass. Ugh, yeah. With just one single partial. Sometimes you get the best bass with just a single cycle. <laughs> nice. And this uses another like PCM car slip. What was that? That. You know, so it becomes part of the sound. One pad. So I wanted like a good... If you so wish. And then... Woo! <laughs> there is a partial which is just woo! Woo! A long ways. Uh. Uh. Yes. So here you go. You've got like this ludicrously powerful synth engine that you have full unfettered access to if you get this plugin as well. And so we've used what a computer is good at, which is giving us like nitty gritty access to like hundreds and hundreds of parameters. And now let's take all 22 sounds and let's stick them in the MC101 and see if we can't make music. And we're back. So I've loaded my little mini library into the 101 and along with a load of samples from my personal collection that I've also added to the SD card, I can now sort of draw on this like library that I've created, very small library, but you could build it up and make battery powered tracks. Now I said earlier, there were two lessons that this thing has taught me. What is the second? Well, I once interviewed Zoe Blade, modular composer, fellow Apex nerd and all-round good human, and she expounded on the benefits of separating the writing process from the sound design process. By making a bunch of sounds and then composing with them, you're not allowing the minutiae of perfecting your sound to get in the way of the first and most important task, which is writing a good tune. Now I'm obviously not saying that there's anything wrong with exploring sound design as a form of writing because of course that's what like electronic music is all about but the truth is that it must mean something significant if your track is still worth hearing even 
by using basic placeholder sounds, for example, because that's the inversion. You could create a basic template of sounds and write with them. And in fact, Zoe does this exact thing and then go back later and change the actual sounds into more advanced, you know, enriched, carefully crafted versions of what you use in your basic placeholder patch. The main point is to separate these two processes by making sounds alone you then get to focus on making music alone and seeing what creative ways that you can push around those particular sounds are and obviously just what melodies you can come up with can you make a catchy tune out of them and then the opposite where you perhaps have basic sounds that you have saved as a template and you make tunes with that basic template but afterwards you load in more interesting sounds or you make them from scratch it was interesting in the process of making this video i made a load of sounds as you saw and then i've loaded them into the mc101 and i just passed some happy hours just jamming away coming up with variations trying out different combinations and riffs and sort of feeling out the tune creatively with the sounds that I had available. And whilst we're looking at the MC101, really this lesson can be applied to the entire studio. So thanks for watching. And if you want to buy Xenology or an MC101 or any of the bits, I've got affiliate links in the description. It is actually incredibly helpful if you want to use those. It helps the channel at no cost to you. And so to play us out, <laughs> let's jam on this weird Aphex C Electro thing that I made using both my samples and of course, all the sound I made on the computer and ported it over. Thanks. Nice.